the module on the inner critic is cracked everything open. By you taking responsibility for someone else's behaviours, you're setting your inner world up in a way which is, is abusive. Do you think there's anger? If, if I'm being really blunt of what I think is happening is, I think there's anger, but I think you're turning it against yourself. Uh, yeah. This is In Therapy with Alex Howard, a first-of-its-kind series that places you directly in the therapy room. My name is Alex Howard, and it is my hope that by bringing you on the journey with us, you too can learn the tools to transform your life. This series, we're following Haley, whose traumatic upbringing has resulted in severe depression and anxiety, as well as debilitating obsessive compulsive disorder. Haley has come to in therapy because she's decided enough is enough and wants to live the rest of her life free from the constraints of the past. She'll be dead and I'll be standing at the edge of a grave going, I, I really tried, and she'll think I didn't try. You have been traumatized by a dynamic and then you have been, in a sense, pulled into an ongoing way of relating, which is fundamentally unhealthy. I've cried too many tears, so I'm not going back. I've been through too much. Join us each week as we follow every step of Haley's journey, both in and outside of the therapy room. As well as the tools I give Haley in the sessions, I'll also be sharing weekly top tips so you can begin to unlock your true potential. This is In Therapy. Good afternoon, Hayley. How are you doing? Okay. Yeah, not too bad. How are you doing? I kind of feel really nervous for once. You feel really nervous? I know, it's ridiculous saying because I don't usually bother, but for the first time ever, I'm like, ooh, I won't go home. <laughs> it's so weird. I mean, if you want to go home, Hayley, you can go home. <laughs> Hello, I've only just got here that we drove this morning. So. Did you? Did you? Yeah, well, okay. come, come take a seat. How, how, how are things generally, though? Do you have, um, mm. you had a lot on last time when we saw you? Lots of different things. Thanks for the water. It's Jeremiah this time, you have to thank. <laughs> yeah, um, mm. yeah, it's been a week from hell. Really? <laughs> but it, it's good that it's come because it's a cracked open Pandora's box and it's like, okay, now you get into the real issues. Wow, Which okay. is probably why I feel nervous. But yeah, it's completely cracked everything open. Wow. Yeah, so I think that's probably why my nerves and my anxiety is all over the place. Okay. Um, but I suppose that speaks testimony to the programme that Alex has put forward for you to follow because I'm thinking, oh, I'm doing okay here. I know half of this, quite arrogantly marching through as you do. And then all of a sudden you hit something, it's like, okay, this is cracked half the pain out now. So it's it's been a, yeah, it's been a tough week, um, but it's, it's, it's good really. The progress we make in therapy is sometimes subtle and not always immediately apparent. However, sometimes we can experience a significant shift in the way we think, feel, and understand ourselves. Something has clearly changed for Haley, and I'm keen to find out what it is. Here's the session. Okay, well, Haley, it's. Love Absolutely, to very surprising. <laughs> <laughs> That's very unkind of most tired, feeling very fragile. <laughs> it's very nice to see you. Um, la when I saw you last week, you were fresh out of um, your triumph with mm -hmm. the um, Commonwealth um, torch, but also it'd been a really intense, um, yeah. intense kind of week or so. So first, you're just wondering how you've been doing since then, and you managed to get some rest and yeah. yeah. Yeah, I was just saying to Oliver before, um, like it's my fifth time and for the first time I feel really nervous, mm. uh, which is crazy because I didn't even feel nervous the first time, but I've walked in today and I'm like um, really sort of edgy. As mm. you've just seen, you just said boo to me, I was like <laughs> genuinely shocked, yeah. even though you're sitting opposite me, I'm like, what's that? You know, so I'm, I'm really like, ah. Um, do, you know, but, do you know why? Yeah, I was, I was just going to say, um, working through the material uh, sort of, 
with the module on the inner critic, mm. it's cracked everything open. Wow. And it's like, okay, so now we've hit the real stuff. Um, the main point of it is, is it's really hard um, to deal with the inner critic when I feel in my life that so many outer critics. Yes. Yeah. And, yes. and so every time I get an outer critic comment, my inner critic psychoanalyzes it and sees if I need to change and adapt. So it's um, a maladaptive response mm. for sure, but it's kept me for 50 odd years you know so i've got it feels like i've got so many outer critics that the inner critic is checking and keeping me to be the best i can be in a difficult situation so it's really hard to let go of it i think what's probably also happening is your inner critic is perpetuating that dynamic in a sense it's like so you've been used to being spoken to in a certain way and then you've learned to speak to yourself in that way and then that's become the normal and then what we're doing is we're putting a spotlight on that and realizing that perhaps not only is that does that not have to be normal but it also is probably quite damaging in, in a sense In the week leading up to this session, my producers Oliver and Jeremiah visited Haley to find out more about how the outer critics in her life affect how she relates to herself, particularly when it comes to her sense of inner worth and inner goodness. So much of how I see myself is wrapped up in how other people see me and I've not always been surrounded by people that have been very positive. So um, what they deem as good matters more to me than what I think is good. But in my opinion, their idea of what's good isn't my idea of what's good. So um, people want to, it's called conditions of worth, I think. People want to meet you into what they want you to be. And I am so not that person. I'm so different, and so in, say, I've got to say it, in my parents' eyes, I'm, I'm not what they want me to be, so they see no goodness in me, so it's it's um, it's really hard, because they want me to be a certain way, and I'm not, and I feel like I'm letting them down, and I can, I've got, I've got shitloads of awards at home i got mind media mental health award got british heart foundation award i've got a queen's platinum jubilee award i've got the baton Cohen award i've got um awards for writing i've got piles of awards at home and they're fucking worthless because i'm not this person that these people want me to be so i could stand there and get any award and it, it's worthless and um because i'm not this person that they want me to be and it's it's like um i'm really sorry but i can't go back in my box because i have to be true to me and i'm sorry that i can't be who you want me to be and i'm sorry you've let you down but um and i'll, I'll like i'll get attacked i've got hammered and hammered and hammered i got hammered this morning hammered 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 and I'm told I'm a horrible person and I said, oh, come on, I, I won an award yesterday. I carried a baton to the top of the mountain and it's just, don't, don't mean anything because I can't be what they want me to be and do what they want me to do, and it, but it's not true to me and I have to be what they want me to be or who I am. You, you know, and I think all the time I'm trying to prove to them that I can do stuff. I'm trying to meet these conditions of worth and, and if I'd get this, you might, you know, and... And I don't know if any of that makes any sense, but yeah, I feel like um, whenever I get something in me that says you did okay, there's a bit of me, I can always hear a voice saying, that's shit, that's shit. And, and the inner critic feels so justified because it keeps me down, you know. But there's a bit, a bit of me that pops through and 
And I stand there and, like, my mum will say, you've really changed you. I don't like the person you are. And, and, and I'll say back to it, thank God I've changed, you know, because... And, and when she, she says, no, God, I'll say, but, but these people think about, OK, look at this award. I've got this, I've got this, I've got this, I've got... You know, and, it, and she just doesn't say anything, you know, and it's just like, I'm not blaming my mum and dad because... Well, my mum, because she's been through stuff and she is who she is, Um but I have to be me, and um, so it is uncomfortable saying that I've done stuff. Back to the session. When you say it's not her fault, whose fault is it? It's, it's I'll have to think about that. Um, so, for what, for what my mum's been through. So I think we have to separate the experience that she's had and the behaviours that she exhibits. Because lots of people have been through awful, difficult experiences, but not everyone comes out behaving the same ways. And so I kind of wonder where that place of personal responsibility lies in that, for her. Yeah. Um, isn't it brain differences? If you, if you, you know... I just can't put any blame at her door. He, he sits at mine. But you see, that's the, I think that's the crux of this issue, isn't it? That it's always your fault and never her fault. And I'm not here to make your mum wrong and to, to, to play a blame game on, on your mum either. But the point that I'm wanting to make is that by you taking responsibility for someone else's behaviours, you're setting your inner world up in a way which is... Is abusive. Yeah, I don't know. She's probably right though. It probably is my fault, like for some of the things. So, so for example, um, um, so my, my brother and his girlfriend, um, I want to put a bit of distance between me and them because I, if I don't, I will have a conversation with them that I fear may hurt them because I'll tell them what I think because I will not be incongruent in a relationship. If you want me in my life, I have to be real mm. or I'm not there. And and so I want to hold them up on some of the behaviour towards my mum um, because I don't want to hurt them. I want to avoid them till I steady myself yeah. and get myself well. So I need that boundary yeah. and, and my mum will not have it and she's threatening suicide, she's... It, playing as calling us in the middle of the night and I'm sending us away when there's nothing wrong. And then she's saying, you're not coming to the hospital with me. You hate me. You're a jealous little bitch. And she's ripping seven balls out of me. Then she went answer the phone. Then she's calling me again saying, come back over my mail. And we're up and down like a yo-yo just being played. And, and it's interesting that you say that you won't be incongruous with someone in your life. But what I'm hearing you say is with your mum, there is some appropriate anger and frustration on in, on your part like there's a place where you can see that her behavior is actually toxic and it's not appropriate um i don't think there's anger um there's deep sorrow do you think there's anger i don't think it's possible for there not to be anger um i i the anger may not be owned and the what i if, if i'm being really blunt of what i think is happening is I think there's anger, but I think you're turning it against yourself. Uh, yeah. So your inner critic has taken yeah. the anger that yeah. actually is suitably placed towards your mum yeah. and is turning it against you. Yeah, yeah. I'm angry with me because yeah. I, I want to make her world right. And I'm really sorry that I can't. All I want to do is make everything right for her. And um, I can't because my brother treats her horrendously. Like she fell out of bed and broke her neck and he said she might die and he wouldn't even go and see her. And yet he eats food there every night downstairs and gets waited on by it. And it's like, how, ca how can you not go up and see your mum who may die because she broke her neck? How can you not go up and say, because you, you know, it's like, I can't sit with that. Yeah. But we can't change no. the relationship between your brother and your mum. Yeah. What we can do is look at your boundaries yeah. and your relationship between you and your brother yeah. and you and your mum. Yeah. Because what I'm hearing is that your mum is, I mean, you, you, you said it yourself, is playing you and is treating you in ways which are, are, are cruel. 
really bad. I got you couldn't make it up. I couldn't even tell you. I could You just honestly, it's really bad. And so something I said to you a few sessions ago is it's almost like there's a continuum of responsibility. Some people blame everyone else for everything and other people blame themselves for everything. The ap- appropriate place to sit on that continuum is probably somewhere in the middle and sometimes it might move a little bit in different directions. But right now, you're making yourself responsible for your mum's actions and your mum's behaviours. And the problem is you can't change your mum's actions and behaviours. So you are not ultimately responsible because responsible means you are responsible. You are able to respond and change the response of what's happening. But you're not able to change it. So by definition of not being able to change it, you can't be held responsible for it. I try try and put everything, I try and be the perfect person. Like she said, you've just said on the phone to me that you only care about your dad. And I was thinking to myself, she sat by a bunch of flowers that I just bought her. She said, I don't care about her. But last night I drove for three hours from where we were in the caravan to be with her because she got a headache to then drive three hours back. So I gave up a night's sleep for her in the middle of the night. My brother lives seven doors down. And she never called him, which called me three hours away. It, it, that My presence there says, I care. But you throw it in my face that I don't care. I care. That's why I was with you all. So how does that make you feel? It, it just devastated. It's like, how can I try any more? What else can I do to make a will right? Because what I feel is your frustration. It's just, just, it's, um, just, I just, I just hate hurting it. And it's like, she'll be dead. She's 83, she'll be dead. And I'll be standing at the edge of a grave going, I I really tried. And she'll think I didn't try. You can't make her think what you might want her to think. And you can't ultimately be responsible for her happiness and her well-being. She keeps making me, she keeps telling me, it's my fault, it's my fault. That's what she's telling you. And that's what historically you've, you've, you've bought as the narrative and the story. And what you and I are doing here together is we are challenging, is that actually true? It's like this is a shared belief in a sense that you have shared with her for, for decades. And it hasn't really been questioned. It's just been she's made you responsible and you've taken responsibility. And like a, a kind of typical functional dysfunctional dynamic it's just continued but what we're doing here together is we're challenging it and we're saying actually it might have worked because you both believe the same belief but there's an enormous price that you are paying in your emotional body and in your physical body for this shared narrative that may not be true there is a part of me that knows that that i know there is yeah because if there wasn't you wouldn't be here yeah there's a part of me that you didn't you didn't come here for me to confirm everything that you've told yourself in the past yeah you came here because there's a place in you that knows that not only could things be different things could be different but things need to be different yeah it's just so hard because it's thrown at me so often and honestly like there's some stuff that i really can't say on camera but there's sure. another side to it that you see how i've been ripped apart and i can't well, it, say it, it. It, it, that, and that's fine it's a trauma response ultimately you have been traumatized by a dynamic and then you have been in a sense pulled into an ongoing way of relating which is fundamentally unhealthy yeah And the reality is right now you are in an unhealthy dance together and you are realizing that you need to change the dance. That's going to leave your mom and your brother and your dad and others one of three choices. They're either going to come and dance with you in the new dance or what's probably more likely to happen, at least in the short term, they're going to try and pull you back to the old dance because that's what's familiar to them or you're going to have to dance separate dances. 
But what I think is clear for you is you can't just stay in the old dance anymore. Mm. Your physical body is giving you the evidence that you can't yeah. do that. Yeah. She uh, she did say uh, you've really changed. You just you used to be okay, but now you're just a jealous little bitch. She said I've really changed, and I, and I said I'm, I, I, the trouble the trouble is um, I'll, I'll stand up to it. And then I hate myself for it. And this is where the inner critic comes in. And it won't be nasty, but I'll hold my own and say, I had to change, woman. And I feel, then I go and cry for hours because I answered her back. Um, that's the hard bit. I know I have to change, but it makes me cry because I've held my own and, and stuck up for myself. And I want to say to her, I'll do anything for you, anything. But there's a part of me where she wants me to reconcile with my brother and his girlfriend. And there's a part of me that can't at this moment because I've got to protect myself. And also I've got to protect them because I'll have them. Because I can't stand what they did. And I'll, I'll, I'll have to say, guys, you're way out of line here. And I don't want that conversation because I don't want to hurt do, them. Do you feel angry towards your brother? No, because he went through what I did, and I feel it's pain. He's reacted the other so way. It's interesting. So what, what what I notice is that, and this is not an uncommon thing, that two things can be true for you at once. So on one hand, there's the emotional place in you that feels the way you describe your brother. There's a there's, I feel a certain amount of anger and frustration and sort of irritation around it. But then what I notice you do is you explain away your feelings with rational, rationality and logic. So, for example, with your mom, there, there are, you can see that the behavior is unreasonable and you can see that it needs to stop. And for you to see that, there must be a certain amount of emotion which is like, this, 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 this is not okay, I, I need this to stop. But then what I notice you do is you, your mind then rationalizes away your feelings, like tells you that, your feelings are not important and they're like this because of what happened to them and it's not their fault. And effectively, you're explaining away your true emotional response to things. Did you, did you, did you yeah, notice that? Yeah, I get that? it. I get it, yeah. The, the thing that doesn't sit with me, I realise that there's an area that others can see things in you that you can't see yeah. in yourself. The thing that never sits with me is I don't call it anger, I call it deep sorrow. It, it, anger doesn't sit with me. I get angry at animal abuse. That makes me angry. That makes me really angry. But I don't feel anger towards. Were, any... were you when you were a, a girl? Were you allowed to be angry? Um, I wasn't. I wasn't allowed to be anything. Right. <laughs> me, I wasn't even right. You know. But you um, particularly wouldn't have allowed to be to be angry. I, um, I saw so much anger in my mom. It, it, it was. A, a th I looked and thought, I will never be that because that is just the most awful. So, thing. What, what? Tell me what you learnt about anger. Um, but I learnt it about every emotion. <laughs> you just that you, sh you shut up. You don't cry if you break your neck. You just shut up. Shut up and don't but, get noticed. But, but you see, I think sadness and deep sorrow seem to be more more allowed in your yeah. inner world. Yeah. But anger doesn't seem to be allowed. Yeah. And let, let me say a few words about my thesis on, on anger and why I think it's so important. Anger is effectively one expression of our life force energy. Our life force energy being our, our passion, our fire, our strength, our... I want this and I'm going to go and make it happen. It's the positive expression. Our personal power, our ability to go, this is what I care about and I'm going to, and I'm going to fight to bring it, into, bring it to life. The destructive expression of that same quality is anger, hatred, aggression. Yeah. But the, the, the energy behind it is a really important, powerful one. Mm. There's a very big difference between having the feeling of anger and throwing anger at other people. Okay. Between having the feeling of anger and acting out the feeling at other people. So you might be feeling really angry and that and my invitation would be to really go into that feeling, but that's not the same as having a massive shouting match at yeah. someone which is often has its place but is often yeah. not so helpful. Yeah. Because the feeling of anger is the is the power behind our boundaries which say no okay like that behavior is unacceptable yeah but to be able to have an empowered no 
Yeah. We've got to have the fuel of, of, of the okay. emotion behind it. Otherwise, is, it's just an empty word. Is it not more emotionally mature to look at with an empathic view of what she's been through to then? Uh, is that not a more, a more emotionally It might be the play, it, it, What people tend to do is they try to bypass their emotions to get to that place. Okay. Now, that may be the emotional destination having metabolized and processed the emotions. But when you try to get there by thinking your way there, what you're doing is you're disowning all of these feelings and emotions that you have. I can't find the anger though. I can find deep sorrow, but I, ca I can't find any anger. It's not her fault. She didn't get the privilege of sitting here like I am. She didn't get that privilege. So how is it her fault? Nobody reached in and helped her back then as she grew up. Therapy was not the thing, you know, so. There's, there's a difference between having empathy for someone and having a boundary to say their behavior is not acceptable yeah. because on the logic that you're running anything can be justified we could you know we could justify putin inv invading yeah. ukraine yeah had trauma went yeah. through difficult experiences yeah that so, so that. that so there has to be a point where one says i can understand in my mind i might even understand in my heart and that behavior is unacceptable yeah, I, I just, it's really difficult because I sit here now and everything you say makes sense. And then when you're not here, everything falls. Mm. Not everything though, mm. because things are changing. And that's the challenge, isn't it? Yeah. That's what, as you, as you, you can, say, that's part of why it's difficult yeah, because things are changing. Yeah. It's, you know, it's and the that, hardest thing for me. You yeah. can ask me to run six marathons after a heart attack. Yeah, yeah, I can do that. I can do anything. I can do my eyes. Yeah, you ask me to do this and it's like, nope. Nope. I will not. And yet, you're here and we're having a very honest conversation about it. And you are starting to put some boundaries in place. Okay. And you're starting to see the situation with a clarity you've not seen it before. Yeah. There, there is a, a gentle ferocity. <laughs> I know that's an oxymoron, but there is within me yeah, that I kind it. of that can I can hold my own. I feel with it. Gentle, a gentle fierceness. Like I know that doesn't make sense, but there is there is a part of me that will. I've, just been through too much yeah. to not hold my own with it and i'll do the most gentleness but I, c I will hold my own because you can't you cannot put me back in that box and i won't go i won't go back in the box i've just been through too much shit what do you feel as you say that because i feel i feel your your strength as you yeah. say that it is it is i do it is strength it's like nah i tell you what i've cried too many tears so i'm not going back i've been through too much Learning to feel your emotions is not just important from the point of view of not carrying those old emotions in our physical and our emotional body. It's also important because our emotions have gifts to bring us in our life. People often think about anger as something to get rid of, to get away from. Now, as I talked with Haley about, it's not about throwing anger at other people, but the life force of our anger is our strength. It's our capacity to, to go for things we want in our lives, but also to set boundaries, to say no, and to feel our strength, our capacity behind that no, behind that boundary. And I find working with people that often there is a sequence to be able to really get contact with and learn to heal our emotions in a healthy way. Firstly, we often have to learn to calm and to settle our nervous system because then we are closer to our feelings. But if we don't then work with our emotions, we'll find ourselves then speeding up again, trying to get away from those feelings. And so as we calm our system and feel our emotions, we're then more able to reset the relationships in our lives. If you'd like to learn more, about the importance of resetting your nervous system. I have a free three-part video series that you can find at reset.alexhoward.com. And as part of that free series, you'll also find out more about my online coaching program, The Reset Program. Did you start to play with the new ways of defending against your inner critic? Um, I couldn't because at the moment, I, I read it and thought about it, but at the moment it feels like I 
can't do any of them because it sits with me. I feel that they should be criticising me and I should be criticising me. So I'm not at that stage yet. Mm. I'm still working through um, where I'm taking it and absorbing yeah. the criticism. I don't know I'm going to stop the criticism feeling that I deserve it. So there's effectively, there's a belief that you deserve the criticism. And until we shift that belief, yeah. what you're saying is the problem is that it's yeah. still going to happen because you believe you deserve it. Yeah, um, yeah. At the moment. Yeah. Yeah. But I like you saying at the moment because what that presupposes is that you believe it can be different. Yeah, yeah. When do you remember first learning this belief that you deserve the criticism? Yeah, um, I was at Butlins um, and uh, it was like a holiday camp. We were sat on the floor. That's funny. It came straight away, isn't mm. it? I didn't even think. I just went bang. Yeah. I know. Uh, we were tiny. I was like three or something. sat on the floor. And, um, oh, hang on. Um, yeah, I was like, sat on the floor, stood up. And the commentator said, sit down if, if you think you're pretty. And everybody sat down and I was the only one stood up with a full awareness that I was ugly. You know, it was, it was something along mm. those lines. I was the one person that didn't sit down when everybody else did. And it was about a compliment about yourself. And I thought, I remember being tiny, thinking, I've got to stand up, I know I'm ugly, I know I'm ugly. Something like that. How old would you have been, do you think? Three. Yeah. Three. Just, just But the fact like, that you had that belief then yeah. means you must have already been told that. Uh, I, I, I don't know. I don't have a memory of being told that. But I, I, I was always called a stupid child. Um, by, by, by who? Um, well, yeah. You know, but it is straight away, I jumped to the empathy and people like they are through what they've been through. Isn't, yeah. Yeah. So going back to what I said a little bit earlier, cause I think it's an important point to reiterate that I think part of what happens is you undermine your emotional response okay. with, with, with a rational response. Okay. And that rational response, I think, is, is your inner critic. I think it's your inner critic presenting in a sly way. Because it's what it's really doing is it, what it's really saying underneath all the words is your feelings don't matter. Okay. The, okay. Rest, is, the rest is just noise. Yeah. You know, it's like, oh, they can't help it. Yeah. Okay. You know, whatever it is, whatever it's saying, what it's really saying is your feelings don't matter. Okay. And your feelings do matter. Okay. Yeah. Okay. How does that feel? I have to walk and carry this and it feels like I can carry it when you're sat there, but like in a few weeks time when you're not in my life, it's like, am I going to be able to grab it and walk with it? And it's this codependency on people that help me. So I'm just going to move in with you, Alex. (laughs) 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 No, it is. I mean, I have to, um, I've got to own it and walk with it for when you're not there. And that's the bit that makes me sad. That it's like, I can do it while you're here, but I can't do it when you're not there. But you see, it's interesting because I think you thought you couldn't do it while I was here. So the fact you can do it while I'm here shows you can do it. Okay. And then it's figuring out how do we need to set things up okay. so you can continue to do it for yourself. Okay. So I'm not moving in with you then. Is that a no? It, <laughs> no. It, it, it's a very clear no, I'm afraid, Haley. Yes. <laughs> Oliver, you like me. He said yes. <laughs> well, there you are. You got, you got a solution. <laughs> it, it is. The, the other, I came with two emotions. One was all this, and the other is this um, sense of loss that, like, you guys have helped me loads, and it is a massive sense of loss and mm-hmm. anticipatory loss. And it is, um, so thank you for helping me, but it is that I'm going to lose this. <laughs> and it's, well, if we, and I say we, I mean all of us, you, I, Oliver, Jeremiah, if we're doing our jobs correctly, yes, there's a, a gradual removing of some of the structure and support, but the things that you're learning, once you've seen, you can't unsee them. You might sometimes forget them and need to find a way yeah. to remind yourself okay. of them. Okay. But they're fundamentally new ways of seeing and understanding your life. Yeah. And you can't unsee them when you've seen them. Okay. So our goal is to help you remember. Yeah. Okay. 
you know? And when it comes to creating change in our life, often the hardest thing is to get the ball rolling. Yeah. You know, it's like taking a car from stationary to 10 miles an hour yeah. takes more power than from 10 miles an hour to 20 miles an hour. Yeah. So what we're doing is getting things moving. Okay. Keeping things moving is easier. Okay. Yeah. It feels like I'm on the right track. Yeah. It's okay. I feel okay. I also think it's important to be okay with not knowing because things have been set up the same way for a long time. And going back to my dance of change metaphor, you realize you want to go into a new dance, but you don't really know the new dance very well. Be a bit like me trying to dance, not very good at it. <laughs> it takes some time to practice. And then with practice, the new, the new dance starts to become the dance which then in time maybe becomes the old dance and it becomes really familiar. Yeah. But you've got to practice to build that familiarity with yeah. it. Yeah. I just feel, but I have to say that I do love my parents. Yeah. It's okay to love your parents, but loving your parents doesn't mean that you can't have boundaries with them. Yeah. And loving your parents doesn't mean that you can't say no to them. Ooh. I don't know. Okay. To say yes to yourself, okay. you have to be able to say no to other people. Okay. And that's really the crux of what we're saying here. Yeah, okay. You can't have your cake and eat it in this situation. You can't yeah. capitulate to all the needs of your parents yeah. and meet your own needs. Okay. I'm not going to give you a lot of homework this week because I think you need to sit with it. <laughs> I think we're saying a lot here. What I think would be helpful to do would be to keep a little bit of a diary each day of some of the instances you notice where you could have put in place a better boundary. Okay. You know, so that example might be, you know, it's Wednesday evening and you had a phone call from your mum and she said that whatever and you just agreed with her and, and apologised. And, you know, another example might be that you were remembering a situation, a conversation you had with your brother a, a while ago and your inner critic was beating you up and you just thought, yeah, that's right. That, so I want to really put the spotlight on and bring the awareness to, to those to those patterns. Yeah. So when something happens, um, you, you just send me one line. Yeah. 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 Okay. Any questions? Can I come live with you? No. <laughs> 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 he said, <laughs> what you really want is the wisdom that we're talking about living inside of you. There's nothing that I'm saying to you that can't live inside of you. But what's important is that it becomes your truth. But what I'm hopefully helping you do is by showing you some different truths helping you find your truth. Okay, good Hayley, I'll see you next week. One of the impacts of trauma is that we can learn that it is not okay or not safe to feel our emotions. And yet it is sometimes those very emotions that are the key to our healing. Healthy contact with our anger is what allows us to say no and set boundaries and ultimately what gives us the capacity to teach people how to treat us in a respectful and appropriate way. Continue to follow Haley's journey over the coming weeks as we release weekly episodes of her sessions with me. You can watch here on YouTube or listen to the episode as a podcast. To help support you in coming on the journey with us, I've created some materials to accompany the series. Each week, there is a bonus video with me and a worksheet to bring the session to life for you. In this week's reflections, you can explore your relationship with anger and some practical tips for how to express it in a healthy way. You can find these resources for free at intherapy.alexhoward.com. Here's what's coming up next week. So you grew up to believe that your mom is more important than you. And you became this person because that was the way you survived. But the bit that I'm really interested in is who you are that isn't that. Well, 
thank you Hayley for That's that okay. um, really appreciate your honesty as always um, mm. and um, yeah well we believe in you is all we're going to say thank you <laughs> oh thank you <laughs> and hopefully yeah. we do, you won't need that yeah. in future hopefully you'll be able to believe in yourself mm. um, but for the time being we have faith that you can do it. Oh, thank you. Well, I'm so glad that you guys are going to live with us forever and ever and ever. And we're going to just take you so this is going to be my bed. <laughs> yeah. um... We're going to have to get a new caravan, please. <laughs> yeah.